Good morning, everybody, and good evening to those of you who are in India. Uh, I'm Sadhanand Dhume from the American Enterprise Institute, and we're looking forward to a very special Google Hangout today on really the burning question that uh, faces India. Uh, as most of you know, there's an election coming up. Uh, election voting starts on April 7th and ends on May 12th. And the front runner, uh, by all accounts, is uh, Narendra Modi. So what we're going to discuss this morning is what might a Modi government look like? Uh, specifically, what should we expect in terms of economics, in terms of foreign policy, and in terms of civil liberties? And with me to discuss this, uh, I have uh, three very distinguished panelists. Um, Adam Roberts, who is the India correspondent of The Economist. Swapan Das Gupta, who is a very well-known columnist who's been writing about these issues for a long time. And Ashok Malik, who is also an extremely distinguished columnist uh, who focus bo focuses both on politics and foreign policy. Uh, you can follow this on Google. We will also be, this will also become a YouTube video when we're done with it. And those of you who have questions and are watching live can tweet in your questions using the hashtag IndiaVotes. Okay, so without further ado, let's launch into the first question. Adam, uh, yeah. what should we expect? What do you think in, term, in, in terms of reform? What do you think a Narendra Modi government would do? Well, I would first of all separate out the idea of reform from the idea of economic management. I think they're two different things. A lot of what people are enthusiastic about with Modi, they look at his record in Gujarat as the chief minister of that state, the very successful uh, developmental record he seems to have there, the high rates of growth that he's overseen in the past dozen years or so, high rates of investment, uh, the enthusiasm that business and investors have for his ability to manage the state. And I think that's what a lot of people are hoping he could do nationally as well, that he would just bring more competence, more ability to implement the decisions that are taken, more authority to get civil servants, to get fellow politicians uh, to do the things they say they'll do. So I think I'd separate out that sort of basic competence and leadership and authority that people are craving somewhat after some years of drift from reform. And I think reform is a more difficult and politically sensitive thing to talk about. Uh, reforms include, uh, for example, getting uh, new labor laws needed for India to improve uh, job creation and so on. And anything that requires legislative changes, getting laws through parliament, will be much harder for Modi or any incoming government to do than the basic sort of economic competence stuff. Um, there are different reasons why Modi would struggle or anyone would struggle, but they include probably not having control of both houses of parliament. And we haven't seen him on the campaign trail talk in any useful detail about reforms. He's given the impression that he would be a better economic manager, that first thing, that ability to lead. But if you press him or if anyone tries to press him on, for example, tricky subjects of reform, foreign investment, uh, in retail, for example, or labor laws, he doesn't give us details. So what I would be sure we would see with a Modi as a prime minister, prime minister is someone who would assert himself more. What I wouldn't be sure we would see is someone who will rush to do the sort of reforms that many commentators, including those of us in this hangout, say are needed. Swapun, would you agree with that? Well, partially I'd agree with uh, what Adam has said. I think one of the main priorities, as far as most Indians are concerned, is a twofold. One is, how do you release the energies, the sublimated energies, which have been put on hold for at least the past three or four years, how do you release them and put them into uh, uh, productive economic use? That's number one. And number two, how do you remove the impediments as far as government is concerned towards entrepreneurship. These, to my mind, are what Indians are really looking for as far as Modi is concerned, to release that energy and somehow get work going, what has been kept in abeyance for a very long time. Now, the question of reform, I think, can be divided into two parts. There are some reforms which can be effected through executive orders, and there are other reforms which need legislation. 
Now, I agree with Adam that legislation is a tricky subject, and we, as yet, till the results are known, don't know how much elbow room the next prime minister has. But as far as executive orders are concerned, I think in terms of drafting, for example, a new mining policy, therefore allowing a uh, power sector to take off, on, uh, you know, the stalled power sector to recover some degree of health, to get certain infrastructural works off the ground, to start off or to kickstart various industrial corridors which have been there, like the Bangalore, uh, Mumbai one, or the half-done uh, uh, Mumbai Delhi one, and, for instance, upgradation of the railways and tourism. These are issues which I think don't need any form of substantial uh, par uh, parliamentary sanction. And I think it's really in those areas which we should look for in the short term as to say where India is going to get in. I think the target of the Modi government will be to somehow raise the GDP, kickstart the GDP by plucking the low-hanging fruit and get to a situation where there is a greater consensus on those more contentious areas. Is there a difference between a, more, between a BJP with 190 and a BJP with 215 in Parliament? Yeah, I, yeah, there would be. There, there certainly would be. I mean, there's more, more uh, there, there are both uh, opportunities as well as threats. I think sometimes we find in India that if you actually have a slim parliamentary majority, you get more reforms done. That's a very ironic situation <laughs> because, uh, because uh, if you have a very comfortable majority, you allow a lot of the diehards who have uh, rather archaic ideological systems in their heads to make a great play and act as a veto. So uh, well, I don't know, it will depend quite a lot on how Modi can manage the coalition politically. And uh, and how he'll manage that, I think we'll have to wait till we get the final results and we know the elbow room, uh, how much elbow room he has for maneuver. Ashok, do you have any predictions of what, what the, the first 100 days? Well, a lot depends on, uh, as you said, whether he gets 190 seats or 215 or 220, because uh, he can afford to be more aggressive if he has the high, a higher number of seats in his first 100 or days. Because uh, while what Chopin is saying is correct, and he can start with the low-hanging fruit and then move to substantive reform later, uh, the fact is he also has a, is going to have a lot of political capital in his honeymoon period. So if he actually has 220-odd seats, I expect he'll push hard. If he has 180, he may not. What would he push hard on if he had 220? I think, for instance, uh, rather than just ensure that, uh, take mining for example, rather than just ensure that uh, power companies can get access to, to, to coal and the, the environment ministry will not be the rent-seeking obstacle it has been for the past few years, uh, he could actually push with opening up mining perhaps, if he does get to 20. Because look, if he gets a high number, it is a mandate for dramatic change, it's not a mandate for incremental change. If he gets 180, <coughs> then it's a mandate for slightly slower change. That's how I see it. Is it a mandate for dramatic change, even though he's not promising dramatic change on the campaign trail? You know, uh, uh, he's spoken more about the economy and about uh, uh, the idea of uh, liberalization and globalization without mentioning those words than almost anybody in any election campaign, in, in, in any national election campaign in India. He spoke to a group of retailers, small retailers, small traders, and said, get prepared for global challenges. Now, depending on how you interpret that, you can interpret it generously or niggardly. Uh, I have chosen to interpret it generously and seen it as a, a step towards saying that we can't roll back FBI and retail entirely. Others have said he should have been more explicit. Now, the jury is open on that. You can argue from both sides. But I think he has spoken about global challenges. He has spoken about getting in technology. He has spoken about uh, bringing in uh, the private sector and by implication uh, foreign investment into uh, defense manufacturing. You, know, you, you can't have a military industrial complex if you don't have a, uh, an industrial complex or the other way around. So I think those are fairly strong statements. Uh, of course, he has to, to deliver on them and get the seats to deliver on them. Uh, Adam, you know, there's a lot of talk about the, the Gujarat model and one of the sort of, one of the, one of the criticisms one hears is that, well, 
all right, mm. he did a pretty good job in Gujarat. Or in fact, he did a very good job in Gujarat. But it's one thing to run a state with a nearly two-thirds majority where your word is effectively law. And it's quite another thing to run a large, complex country like India. So, I mean, so how do you, I mean, where do you come down on that question? I mean, can he do what he did in Gujarat? No one thinks it's, it's, he's going to try to do exactly the same thing. But how, where do you come down on that, on, on, on that question, that how relevant yeah. is what he has done in Gujarat to what he could do in New Delhi? Well, it follows on from what we were just saying about the um, the size of the <clears throat> the majority he may get, or the size of the share of his seats in parliament he may get. What we don't know, of course, is how strong the opposition would be. One reason why Congress has failed, despite saying the right sort of things about uh, getting certain reforms through uh, in the last two or three years, is it's failed to control parliament. It's failed to manage its processes in parliament properly. Now, we don't know how Modi would would manage if he had to get reforms through Parliament. Affect a president over his own territory. He is extremely good at motivating those who follow his orders and following up and implementing what he does. What we don't know is how good he is at managing rivals, managing members of the who people who are against him. And what we've seen, for example, in the last week with the rivalry within his party, within the BJP, certain older leaders falling out with him, suggests that he doesn't have a very, uh, uh, a very easy style, that he isn't someone who is great at sort of rubbing along easily with his, his uh, fellow politicians. So there'll be all sorts of challenges and tests that he faces as a prime minister that he's not prepared for. But one thing we can say about him is at least he's been tested as a chief minister. Many other candidates haven't had the experience that he's had in running a state. Uh, Raul Gandhi of, of Congress, for example. So at least he comes into office aware somewhat of what it requires to get government done. Many other people have come into office in India and elsewhere without that minimal level of experience. Sopal, would you like to jump in on that? Yeah, I think uh, I agree with Adam that there are very many imponderables and many, very many un unanswered questions. But I think there are two or three points which I think we need to flag in this respect. One is that when we talk about the Gujarat model, I think it is extremely unlikely and uh, interacting with Mr. Modi, I've also got the sense that it's not a question of transplanting in two to a model onto the rest of India, some of which have very, very different priorities mm -hmm. and, very, and some of which have very different economic cultures. I think the basic thing is a question of approach. And there are two, uh, there are some features which are quite interesting. Number one, I think under a Modi government, you're likely to see a greater devolution of fiscal powers to the states. The implication of that in economic terms is that we are likely to see states which go ahead, which are moving fast, actually move faster, while states which are slow and have different priorities can be allowed the political luxury of doing their own thing. Now, the implication of that is probably the notion of a redistributive center, which was the hallmark of the entire Nehruvian consensus, is going to break down. And we're going to have a different sort of uneven patterns of development in India. Now, that politically, how do you manage it is very is, is, is really uh, the question which will have to be explored in the coming months. The other point which I want to talk about is the larger philosophy of the Red Modi. And in terms of philosophy, Ashok mentioned one particular speech of his. Now, in another speech which was given to... I think it was mainly for fund managers and things like that, uh, uh, entrepreneurs, where he spoke about something which I've heard no other Indian politician in the past 60 years talk about it, that the philosophy of governance should involve the right of choice. Now, it might seem very mundane as far as the US is concerned. It may be very mundane as far as the Western democracies are concerned. But in the context of India, it's something no politician ever talks about. So in terms of his basic orientation, his instincts, his instincts would be to try and find innovative, non-conventional, within the Indian context, solutions to existing problems. And that's where I really see a great ray of hope as far as India is concerned. Let's take a question from Twitter now. And I'm going to toss this to Ashok. 
Ashok, there's a question from Twitter from someone called Harsh XLRI, and it is, what should Modi do to generate employment opportunities in India? Well, he has to kickstart manufacturing, and that's not like easy and can't be done in a day. But the fact is, we've been talking about ma in starting Indian manufacturing, or getting Indian manufacturing going for 20 years, and we've got nowhere with it. Uh, that has to be those those two industrial corridors, for instance, some big infrastructure projects. Uh, because remember, the Golden Quadrilateral, the highway project which uh, the Vajpayee government uh, initiated, did have a, a knock-on effect and did create jobs and generate an economy down the line. Uh, so a couple of big infrastructure projects, which I'm sure he'll think of it. immediately he has indicated the, uh, that to kickstart domestic demand and then looking at uh, uh, Indian manufacturing really which uh, has been completely neglected in this uh, whole fervor about uh, India being a services sector economy. Adam, another question from Twitter. This is from someone called Panic Trade. What would be NAMO's approach to entitlements and welfare? Can he reform subsidies? Well, I think <clears throat> I think it's essential that he he tries. I mean, we're talking about him suddenly waving a magic wand and getting infrastructure projects going, but you know these these aren't uh, failing to happen just for the fun of it. You need a lot of money to get infrastructure projects going. You need to have resources to throw at it. And I think if he seriously wants to to really ramp up infrastructure spending and maybe get the sort of situation we see in Gujarat, the uh, the power, the, the roads, the the gas grid and so on that Gujarat enjoys spread out to more of the rest of India, that involves a huge amount of public spending and that will require cutting uh, or shifting spending away from uh, welfare payments for example. So now one option would be to, to shift that burden or decision making to the states to decide how they want to balance infrastructure spending versus welfare spending. But there are certain entitlements that are locked in and if we look at how he has at least behaved in the campaign trail and the way he's talked about uh, entitlement spending. Uh, at least in terms of how he wants to present himself, he hasn't looked particularly radical. For example, the right to food bill that uh, the Congress government rather cynically brought in uh, a year or so ago in order, in a, an attempt to win votes, which I don't think will work very well for them, but it was clearly intended to win votes. Mr. Modi's response was to say that it wasn't generous enough and that there should have been more spending on it. Now that may well have been posturing on his part, but it suggests he's he feels vulnerable. He feels a little unsure in how radical he can dare to be in slashing welfare spending. I do agree, though, that in person, when you sit down and talk to him, as I've done, about these things, he does want to cut welfare spending. He thinks that people should have opportunities to get jobs. He thinks that he's quite proud of the fact that in Gujarat there's a very low take-up of the Enrega job creation scheme. Uh, for him, that's a badge of honor, and we can learn from that that he would like to replicate that across the rest of India. So we would certainly expect him not to expand the existing uh, welfare proposals, but whether he'll have the, the political will to cut it is another thing. Ashok? Uh, you see, he's unlikely to have the political will, as Adam says, to, to actually cut welfare spending though he can probably put a stop to more welfare programs coming in. But what he can do is link these welfare programs, particularly uh, the National Rural Employment Guarantee Program, to actual asset creation. Because essentially what people are being paid for now is to, to, to use the cliche, dig holes and then fill them up. Uh, they aren't trained to build roads or build infrastructure, and therefore they aren't employed in doing that and you, you can't use them to, to build permanent assets. I think linking welfare programs to skill building and therefore to the, uh, as a corollary to infrastructure building is uh, one program he will certainly look at. But again, it can't, if there's no magic wand, it can't be done overnight. We are still looking at a two, three year timeline at the very minimum. Okay, so let's pivot from here to foreign policy and I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna stay with the show and ask you the first question here. There, there's a, there's, there's, how would a Modi foreign policy, in the broadest sense, how would it be different from, say, a Manmohan Singh foreign policy? Interesting question, because uh, as I've often said, uh, Modi's foreign policy will not be different from Manmohan Singh's foreign policy, as Manmohan Singh privately believes India's foreign policy to be. It will be very different from the foreign policy Manmohan Singh in 
implemented or was allowed to implement by the Congress party, which obviously shares a very different worldview. Uh, Modi in this campaign has indicated that he believes uh, economic growth and the prosperity of India's people should be the cornerstone of his, his foreign policy or any foreign policy. Uh, Modi's priorities will be uh, taking Indian growth uh, rates back to respectable figures and sustained respectable figures. It would be to uh, access technology to get the Indian manufacturing story going. Uh, it would be to, uh, and, and that would require both foreign policy and domestic policy changes. It would be to uh, secure the homeland, to use a US expression. Uh, in a time when uh, there's great uncertainty as to what's happening, going to happen in Afghanistan and Pakistan post 2014. And finally, uh, it would be to address the issue of China, uh, the question of regional balance, the question of China being both a short-term, uh, medium-term economic opportunity and a long-term political challenge. Uh, and essentially, none of this goes any, uh, gets anywhere without high growth rates, consistently high growth rates. Without, uh, uh, high growth of uh, 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 GDP that rises dramatically and quickly, uh, India does not have much of a foreign policy. I think Manmohan Singh recognized this, couldn't do a thing about it. Uh, Modi is his own man or will be his own man, so perhaps he'll be able to achieve something more. Swapan, would you agree with that? The idea that this is that, that foreign policy, in a sense, is going to be an extension of economic policy? Absolutely. I think there's going to be two aspects of foreign policy. I think number one is going to be a policy of the neighborhood, which Ashok pointed it as securing the homeland. It's a nice sort of turn of phrase, uh, although that hasn't been used here. But yes, that is going to be the main priority as far as neighbors are concerned. And I think there will also be an attempt to perhaps move away from the park-centric neighborhood policy and actually engage far more meaningfully with some of the others like Burma, Sri Lanka, there are a lot of complex issues there. As far as the wider world is concerned, economics is going to dictate most things. But there are certain interesting sidelights to this. I expect, for example, India to have a far more meaningful relationship with a country such as Japan. And there are growing convergences of the strategic vision between Japan and India, between Singapore, between Australia, Vietnam, Korea. So you, you could say perhaps the old bogey of the encirclement of China. But I think there is a natural appeal which that sort of an approach has towards the two uh, people within the BJP. And certainly I believe that the economic cooperation and that strategic vision of somehow ensuring that China doesn't run away with all the prizes is going to be a feature. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to take a, a, a attitude of complete hostility towards China. And as far as the West is concerned, two factors. Number one, above all, economics. And number two, and this is something which is very dear to the heart of Modi himself, it's going to be quite a lot connected with the Indian diaspora. I think he feels very strongly about the Indian diaspora. He uh, identifies very well with their aspirations, with their sort of social mobility, with their movement upwards in various parts. And I think India will sort of do its bit to try and encourage them and use them as ambassadors to offset what I think is going to be a formidable international lobby which will act against Modi initially if and when he comes to power. Adam, Modi or West, fraught relationship, where do you see it going? Well, I agree with a lot of, of what we've just said, um, what has just been said about Modi and foreign policy. I, I think he's not really paid very close attention to it for the good reason that Indian voters care very little about it and it'll have, unless there's some terrorist attack connected to Pakistan or something like that, I, I don't think many voters uh, are, are particularly moved even by the you know the row with the US over the Cobregade, the diplomat case. Um, but I would expect the broad thrust of relations between India and the US, despite the wobbles, the, the problems that there's been in the last couple of years, to continue being driven in, in into each other's arms. Basically, there is the concern about China. There is the need to have closer economic engagement. And there are the military ties, the shared exercises, the military exercises in the Indian Ocean, 
that will uh, will keep on pushing closer relationships at a structural level. There are two things I would add that we haven't yet mentioned about Modi and foreign policy that may be slightly beyond his control. One is his coalition partners. And if we're looking for his policy in the region, how, for example, does he handle Sri Lanka? Well, that will depend to a great deal on whether he has Jaya Lalitha, the chief minister of Tamil Nadu, as one of his larger coalition partners and how much she feels she would have to make a very strong uh, statement of support for the Jaffna Tamils in the north of Sri Lanka. The second thing that we don't know with Modi is how he would handle events and much of foreign policy is not planned, it's thrust upon you. And if we had another incursion by the Chinese in Ladakh, as we saw last year, Mr. Modi has said that he would be far more assertive, far more willing to confront China and to send it packing. I can't remember the exact words that he used, but he basically said he would be a more aggressive uh, leader and voters do like that. But when it comes to acting on those statements, um, we don't know how he would handle it. And of course, um, the, the proof of the pudding will be in the eating and he may well end up performing rather like Manmohan Singh has performed and realizes that his military capacity, his economic priorities make it difficult to act any differently really to the way that Manmohan Singh has behaved. Let's take another question from Twitter. Um, Ashok, there's some, so, someone called Bodhi Sattva asks, uh, how is India's Middle East policy going to be different under Modi? Well, for one, uh, I think uh, high-level Israel will recommence after 10 years of uh, UPA trying to run away from the fact that Israel is one of our closest friends in the Middle East. Uh, second... Uh, How did the UPA try to run away from that? Well, it was just politically very, very uncomfortable with uh, facing up to the fact that Israel was a friend of uh, India's and it was too worried about domestic constituencies and uh, Muslim vote banks to, in some parts of India. Uh, the, the whole UP election, for instance, uh, in, in 2012, which the Congress uh, did very badly in, uh, and ended up derailing, among other things, uh, Israel policy. But Israel has uh, invested heavily in uh, uh, relationships with a lot of Indian state governments across party lines and Israel has a lot of goodwill in India. Uh, Israel also shares a similar skepticism about the Obama administration uh, which uh, not just Modi but a lot of people in Delhi do. Uh, that, that there's a sort of another story which, there which we should talk about sometime later perhaps about how uh, the Indo-US relationship irrespective of whether Modi comes in or doesn't is not in very good shape. Uh, apart from uh, uh, Israel which I expect will be, Modi will quite visibly befriend Israel and uh, perhaps you, you could see a Prime Minister will visit one way or the other very soon. Apart from that, I expect a lot will depend on what uh, the Americans do uh, in Afghanistan post-2014 and the situation there because uh, that is emerging as, that's, of course, as it's a crossroads of Central Asia and the Middle East, but it's emerging as a huge, huge challenge. And finally, of course, uh, energy sources are very close to, uh, Mr. Modi has spoken about it at, at various public fora for as well that uh, we need closer relations with uh, countries that are, are energy sources, countries such as, uh, of course, Australia at one level, which is not in the Middle East, but also Qatar and uh, such countries. So, the big, the big question in Washington on foreign policy, of course, is uh, what is Modi's view of the United States? What does this mean for the U.S.-India relationship? Well, I mean, there is always a personal element in this. I don't think, I mean, we're talking about Indo-US relations under Modi, we can take away the fact that as far as Modi is concerned, a much, a certain very powerful section of the American establishment did treat him like an ogre. And I think memories of that cannot be wiped away overnight. I think what can be said with a degree of certainty is that Modi is determined to keep the personal angle separate from a larger question of Indian foreign policy. The perception has drawn around in India is that India and US has engaged without necessarily with uh, that relationship being terribly beneficial to India. This is a perception. This may not actually correspond with reality. But there is an undercurrent of anti-American feeling in India which has certainly erupted ever since Barack Obama assumed the presidency. Some of it is centered on the question that, well, Americans are not really bothered about what India is concerned. 
the other princes that they're a bit too intrusive, they have their own ideas about the world which they want to introduce into the rest of the world, etc., etc. Now, I think the only way this climate of suspicion, it's not a climate of hostility, but it's certainly a climate of suspicion, can be offset is if the people who have an interest in a more deepening economic and strategic engagement with India take the upper hand both at the State Department White House level as well as within India. I don't think we are likely to see within India anybody, uh, the pathological cold warriors of yesterday reasserting themselves, that's unlikely to happen. But that wariness of America is going to remain. And I think India will tread a little cautiously. And I think a generous gesture from America in the initial stages will do much to offset the, uh, you know, the adverse climate. And I think the ad ad adverse atmospherics. You think that if America, let's say, extends its hand, you think that 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 he will he will accept it? Yeah, I think so. But let's remember there are various other outstanding issues which merely a symbolic gesture cannot. Do. There are various complex trade issues which have to be negotiated very hard and in keeping in mind, you know, national interests and which have a more, more than a bilateral. They have a multilateral significance. Those are separate issues, and I think. Any, even if you have a good friendly relationship, such disputes are going to persist. But for the moment, I think, the feeling in India that the United States tried to interfere in the domestic affairs of, of the country by expressing its political preference against one individual who has circumvented it and may now become prime minister of this country, I think that has to be addressed somewhere along the line. Adam, what's your take on uh, on on, on India-Pakistan relations under Modi? They, I, I've heard two very widely divergent views on this. I'd like to sort of you know, where where do you come down on this? Well, if you ask Pakistanis what they think about Modi coming to power and and how would he uh, handle the bilateral relationship, most people are surprisingly sanguine about it. They immediately refer to the Vajpayee government. They talk about the uh, Nixon goes to China thesis, the idea that actually handling a BJP government might be more straightforward than handling a Congress one. And there's a sort of general sense that they might not like Modi. They're certainly very skeptical about what happened in Gujarat in 2002. It's not only the Americans who have strong views about what happened then. It's many, many other countries too. And Yet, I think they feel that if Modi is elected, they'll do business with whoever is elected in, in India. And like many others, they would like to see a leader in India who can deliver on his promises. Um, they've been talking to Manmohan Singh, uh, at least uh, surreptitiously, about his visiting, his coming and visiting his uh, place of his birth. I was with Nawaz Sharif today after he was elected in Pakistan last year. He made a very, very clear invitation to the Indian Prime Minister to come and open up warm relations with Pakistan and I think probably feels that uh, uh, the sort of the opening up of Pakistan at least the civilians were looking for hasn't been reciprocated maybe for very good reasons but it hasn't so I think the sense of the people I talk to in Pakistan is that at least with Modi you would know what you were getting you would have a man that if he talked about doing a deal might well be able to deliver on it that said I also think there would be some within Pakistan who would be very keen to test Modi. And I'm thinking about groups uh, related to the ISI, the militant groups who have for long periods of time uh, attacked Modi and attacked what happened in Gujarat. And I would worry somewhat that there will be extremists in Pakistan who think that uh, um, India run by Modi is all the more of a juicy target for them uh, in the post-American, post-Afghanistan uh, American war period than it was previously. So I would say that in Pakistan, um, it, it's not directly easy to read, but there'll be many in the civilian uh, administration who are fair, perfectly happy with Modi, and then some of the extremists who think that they can maybe exploit his coming to power. Ashok, sure, well, how would you respond to that? You see, uh, it's all very well to say that uh, uh, 
BJP Prime Minister winning a good number of seats is a, can do a deal with Pakistan because he's a Nixon who goes to China. Or that uh, as the Indian economy grows, uh, we trade with each other and uh, we all become good friends. Even Pakistan has do this prosperity that binds us together and we can trade, we can sing songs, uh, kebabs and all of that is fine. Now, all of that is true, but uh, please understand there are three fundamental differences between the Vajpayee period in the early part of the century and a possible Modi period. The three conditions that are different. One, uh, in, after 2001, Afghanistan became the bigger jihad and Kashmir the smaller or the forgotten jihad. That gave us a 10-year window when actually things were much better on our, in terms of our security, apart from the odd Bombay. Uh, and certainly Kashmir has been very quiet this, this century for this decade so far. Uh, second, uh, the American presence in the region uh, made that the fact that, that Bush and the Republicans got along with both Vajpayee and later Manmohan Singh and had some influence over Musharraf in his early years uh, made them a, a sort of guarantors of of any undertake or, or, or guarantors of any uh, arrangement or any peace uh, talks between the two countries. They could hold. Uh, they had some influence over us. They had some influence over uh, uh, Musharraf, and there was a trust between Delhi and Washington, which is absent today. And third, remember, the Indian economy was beginning a decade-long boom. So when your economy is growing at 7 or 8 percent, you have the domestic political capital uh, to be a little magnanimous with your neighbor and to push for a deal. And your domestic voter supports you. All of these factors are no longer present. Our economy has come out of that boom and we are actually declining. And any new government, Mr. Modi's or whoever, will need three or four years of demonstrating economic success to rebuild that domestic political capital. Second, Absolutely. Afghanistan and Pakistan are in a complete uh, are a complete question mark now, and uh, frankly, Obama doesn't have the same influence or relationship with Delhi that Bush did. That leads to a question from 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 Twitter, so from someone called Karthik Nine, and you know you have a deteriorating situa security situation in Pakistan and Afghanistan. Uh, we have this ten-year peace dividend in Kashmir that may be drawing to a close. Um, what would a Modi administration's Kashmir policy be against this backdrop? Are you asking me that? Yeah. Uh, okay. It all depends on events. As as uh, Adam said, there is a perception that in Delhi that there are groups in Pakistan, perhaps within the ISI, perhaps the Lashkar, perhaps the army, whatever, that will test Modi as they have tested previous new Indian leaders like we saying in 1990 or, or Vajpayee with Kargil. Uh, if that test is a significant test, then I'm afraid uh, any prediction is, is pointless. If that test is manageable or that does not happen, then I think uh, Modi may go back to, uh, especially after the Kashmir election in, in October this, or November this year, go back to engaging uh, domestic groups in Kashmir, which uh, uh, which frankly the UPA government neglected. Because remember the Vajpayee government uh, pushed for a very free and fair election in 2002, which was still then the freest election in Kashmir, and then began talks with sections of the Hurriyat in, in Jan 2004, Adwani, the great Hindu heartland, actually was in talks with the Hurriyat, which was a very rich legacy to leave the UPA with. The UPA dropped the ball. Uh, I expect Modi would attempt to pick it up again, especially after the assembly elections, provided he has provided the space, uh, and events don't take place from across the board. Great. Well, but let's pivot now to the final final third of our program, and I'm going to start with with Swapan. Uh, you know, the, the the big question is, what does what does the rise of Modi mean in ideological terms to Indian politics more broadly? What's what's the significance of this? Well, I think we'll be able to assess the entirety of the ideological impact in hindsight. For the moment, and at the risk, and this is a very much a tentative conclusion, I think what we have is a person who is clearly at odds with the Nehruvian consensus, making a bid for power and succeeding on the strength of that. And there are various features of that which comes into mind. Number one, the idea of greater decentralization, which is against the Nehruvian consensus of very centralized, one size fits all in there. 
we have a person who believes that the ultimate test of secularism is how much you are indifferent to sectoral, sectional concerns as far as your policy making is concerned. In Indian secularism, of course, involves sort of equal respect for all religions. I think that's given. And India is very, in principally, a very religious country. All the faiths have their own uh, very committed followers. But I think the idea of using a minority as a vote bank is something Modi has consistently fought against. And that's really the greatest fault line. When you have people who question Modi's liberal credentials, they are fundamentally questioning the idea that Modi can actually appeal to the electorate without making specific and uh, without making specific promises to the Muslims. Now Modi has seen the uh, the past record as one of creating alarmism amongst the minorities, an attempt to ghettoize them and keep them away from the mainstream, keep them away from economic development. So he has a very fundamentally different policy. Thirdly, and I think this is an interesting point, is that when if Modi is elected and, and becomes the Prime Minister, he will probably be the only Prime Minister in India who will have fought off the concerted attempt by the Indian liberal intelligentsia, which don't, dominates the discourse in India. He would have cocked the snook at them and said, you tried for 15 years, you tried for a long time, to rubbish me, to make me, to vilify me, to create a demonology around me, and you have failed. And it is the fear of that section of the intelligentsia, the fear of marginalization, which is giving rise to the concern, oh, Modi's rise will, uh, will, will, will signal a threat to civil liberties. This will be the India, this will be the end of India as we know it. This will be an erosion, it will be a destruction of the idea of India. No, I don't think it will be anything like that. India will be a very similar place. But certain political priorities will change fundamentally. And I think how much they change, the extent to which Modi is able to redefine the terms of politics is something which we can only judge in hindsight. At the moment, I think we can only go by these. How important is it, Swapan, to, for, to, for him to get a Muslim buy into this? I ask this because I was looking at some polls recently which say that Modi in fact leads, he's the most popular Indian politician among every demographic, every caste, every subcaste. Uh, the only demographic where he's not is with Muslims and there in fact he has only about 12 percent support. So what do, to what degree can this, 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 this Modi idea which is that it's not about pandering to every group it's more about being indifferent to religious identity as a marker when it comes to public policy. To what degree can that be implemented without a Muslim buy-in? I think there is a Muslim fear which has been contrived, which has been manufactured, which is to say that Muslims will be unsafe in a Modi-led India. I think Modi's best way of securing the trust, I don't think he'll get the support of Muslims in Ari to get the trust of Muslims is by ensuring that nothing happens which endangers their security. And once that is assured, I think a lot of other things fall into place. But you're right, it is not a very healthy sign if one section of the community feels that the rise of a leader who has the endorsement of everyone else constitutes a threat to them. And this is a challenge which he'll have to meet. And I think I find it heartening that at least some elements of the Muslim community have decided to break ranks and at grace risk to their personal reputation and with sort of threat of community ostracism actually gone and joined the Modi campaign. Of course, they are individuals. And of course, and some people can say these are opportunists and they are governed by expediency, etc. But at least there's a welcome sign. But at the end of the day, Nothing will speak like the, uh, the fact that Muslims remain secure in India. That's the, at the bottom line of it. Adam, why don't you jump in on that? Well, I'd say that 
maybe there's an understanding of what civil liberties uh, mean in India that is different from the sort of thing that I would understand coming as an outsider, but civil liberties aren't just about the concern of one particular minority group, in this case the Muslims, they're about all sorts of uh, individuals who might criticize an incoming government or might be feeling ostracized at the moment. I would love to see Narendra Modi talking up the social liberal side, the, the more libertarian side that Americans might call it, but at least someone who would talk about individual rights and the need to defend those, uh, as well as talking about development and, and the need to get the economy going. Um, I would like, for example, for him to talk about gay rights. The, the Congress at least has uh, the credit of, of talking about addressing the Supreme Court ruling back in December and saying that it would be in its interest, it would like to see an India where there was uh, decriminalization, at least perhaps legalization of, uh, of gay rights. Um, I'd like to see Mr. Modi talk about, for example, uh, how it's wrong to ban books and how, for example, when his government banned a book it didn't like about Mahatma Gandhi a couple of years ago, that was a mistake. I think there are many, not people who are only concerned about what happened in 2002 in Gujarat, who worry that there'll be a more intolerant sort of government that will be less willing to see um, <clears throat> a commentary that it is unhappy with. Uh, there is said to be, among some journalists at least, a sense in the last few months that their owners have been putting, uh, putting pressure on uh, the journalists in those groups in India not to be too critical about Mr. Modi. So there is a sense that perhaps civil liberties will be under pressure uh, with a new government and it's not only about Muslims. What do you think he would have to do to, to, to calm those fears? Well, I think he could come out directly and, and give a message, for example, uh, addressing to the two things I just mentioned there. Or if he wanted to talk about uh, addressing the Muslim concerns, he could sit down and give a serious interview where he would describe what happened in 2002 in Gujarat, uh, why he feels it was a terrible experience, why he failed uh, to do more to stop it, and how he would ensure that nothing like that could ever happen again. Now, I can understand that politically he may prefer not to have that conversation, but if he wants to reassure those who are anxious about civil liberties, he should try and address that subject head on in the way that you might expect a Western politician to say, OK, there is some massive issue that's looming in my past that many voters, not just Muslims, are concerned about. So let me sit down with the right interviewer and address those concerns and explain why it's no longer an issue that you should be worried about. The fact that he doesn't do that is troubling, and that's one reason why not only Muslims feel that there's something unresolved there. Ashok? You know, I'm not sure whether some people, uh, to use Adam's uh, words, uh, would ever feel this issue can be resolved, even if uh, Mr. Modi gives 100 interviews to uh, you know, 100 appropriate but journalists. Has, but has he tried, is the question. You see, there are two things here. One, I think sometime after he becomes Prime Minister, if he becomes Prime Minister, uh, he has to have a conversation with India. He has made an attempt with at some of his public meetings in this election campaign uh, about, by talking about, for instance, Hindus and Muslims not fighting each other but fighting poverty, uh, which was what he said in Patna. Uh, he has to have this conversation at, uh, as Prime Minister if he become one. Uh, more important, more than talk about 2002, he has to demonstrate that he has a new agenda or a different agenda for India's Muslims, different from what our previous governments have had. And I think uh, if, they, if there is no breach of peace, as it were, un, under his uh, prime minister or under his watch, if uh, there is no violence done to Muslims or against Muslims, and if they are uh, clear beneficiaries of an overall economic uh, growth that benefits everybody, I think that will see Muslim the Muslim mood towards him soften. It may not see him winning a lot of Muslim votes. But do remember, even in Gujarat, where he wins huge majorities, he doesn't get a majority of but he gets more Muslim votes today than he did in 2002, and he gets lower levels of Muslim hostility than he did in 2002. I think that's the best he could hope for in two or three years. Uh, the question from Twitter uh, for, uh, for, and I'll, I'll, for, I'll pose this to Swapan. Someone called D. Bide asks, uh, what qualities do you think made Narendra Modi, though he was vilified by the Congress and the media and NGOs for 10 years, become the most popular leader in India? Well, I think Indians or any person, any any country would love a leader who keeps his nerve 
in the face of adversity. Modi was suddenly one who kept his nerve throughout. Had a single-mindedness of purpose, which was to shift the agenda from sectarian issues, which, which, which once prevailed in Gujarat, to economic development, and work relentlessly for that one goal. Thirdly, I think what Modi has done is that the reason why Modi is so attractive to Indians is that he does not come from within the beltway. He is a break from the cozy consensus which has so far dominated Indian politics, where at the end of the day, regardless of which party you come from, you're really part of the club. He is not part of the club. He's a rebel. He's an outsider. He's an outsider whose appeal has come in very, very strongly ever since India faced economic adversity, relative economic adversity over the past five years, where Indians think they have underperformed because they lack robust, strong, determined leadership. And they feel that a person who has a fierce sense of integrity can actually overcome these adversities. So it's a combination of both the context in which Narendra Modi has emerged, as well as some of his personal qualities, which is India. But I would like to highlight this fact that today, much of the opposition to Narendra Modi from a very dominant section of the establishment stems from the fact that he is not one of them, that he does not come from within that cozy establishment. And he is also determined to change that establishment in a long way. So that makes him very, very different. Would you, would, would, would you say that that is also what makes him scary to many people? Undeniably so. Well, it certainly makes him very scary. You know, uh, in, in recent months in Delhi, as the political stock of Narendra Modi has been soaring, we have come across this mood of complete alarmism. Oh my God, Modi is coming. Should, 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 we take a, should we buy a one-way ticket out of India? And most of the people who have been saying it are not necessarily people who are uh, ordinary sort of street corner folks. But there are people who hold very, very privileged positions in society. They feel that their number is up. And I want you to, and I, and I keep mentioning this, that a lot in the West in particular is influenced by these people because they have a disproportionate stake. They have a disproportionate voice in the Indian country. Modi, in, uh, two days ago, for example, I was hearing uh, a comment by a rather well, well privileged Congress MP from Mumbai, Bombay, who said, oh, you know, Modi lacks class. I mean, that's the sort of derision which is there. And I think the attempt to paint him as something which he is not, and try and paint him as someone who is rigid, who is a complete fanatic, a Hitler reborn in India, that's a part of this whole exercise. And I think that really the, the, uh, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. So if Modi becomes, Prime Minister, I think a lot of people may find that instead of the ogre which they set out to meet, they might actually come across a person who is innovative, who is a little different, and therefore is treated with a degree of wariness by people who believe that they have a divine right to rule India. Adam, is Modi being painted as something he's not? I'm sure that there are some people, the, the individuals that Swafan mentions, who, who maybe over-exaggerate how much of a threat he would be. I, I've not heard of anyone talking about a one-way ticket out of India if he gets oh, elected. Yeah. Maybe I'm not <laughs> mingling with the right people. Awesome, <laughs> um, but but um, I think we have to be a little careful about investing too much into the success that's coming for Modi. I mean, we did see not many months ago, in Delhi at least, that Arvind Kedrival and the AAP did rather well in the state elections here, and that was a function of, of voters here absolutely disgusted with Congress, fed up with uh, a very long period of Congress rule, looking for an alternative to, well, in the case of Delhi, to the chief minister here, but in the case nationally of, of getting away from the Nehru Gandhi family. 
and looking for someone else credible. And in Delhi, a lot of people piled in and voted for the Aam Aadmi Party in surprising numbers. Now, they may not vote again for the Aam Aadmi Party. Maybe that party is already a busted flush. But it did suggest that only two or three months ago, a lot of people who were ready to dump Congress were not ready to go for Modi. And that doesn't suggest enormous enthusiasm uh, f of the sort that Swapan is describing. I've just come back from a, a trip to the south of India, where it's true that Modi as an individual is popular. Uh, if you ask people who've been doing surveys down there, he individually is uh, you know, a very credible, uh, people are enthusiastic about the idea of him as prime minister. But it doesn't mean that they're enthusiastic about everything he stands for. It doesn't mean they subscribe to everything the BJP stands for. They're not actually going to vote for BJP candidates in the elections. So I think we have to be somewhat more measured in our explanation of what he means and what a victory for him, which everyone expects is likely, um, should be taken to mean in India. All Indian politics ends up being a function of, of very complicated three or four corner races in the states of alliance politics, of coalition politics. And describing from that that everything Modi uh, believes is therefore what every Indian voter now believes is, I think, far too big a jump. Yes, there's a shift in how Indian voters think. Yes, there's enormous enthusiasm for Modi. I don't deny that. But I don't think we should overinvest in, in what this means ordinary Indians are changing their minds about. I have a question, uh, Ashok, from Twitter from Sunanda Vashisht. And she says that Modi hasn't changed. Development is his passport to get votes in Gujarat, and that continues. Have Modi's critics changed? Uh, some of Modi's critics uh, haven't changed at all, uh, other than one or two who wrote op-eds this morning in some newspaper. <laughs> Uh, and some of them are indeed uh, running scare campaigns. We will migrate or whatever, do other things. But going back to this question as and linking it to what Adam just said, uh, you see, uh, this election comes at the at the intersection of two or three very interesting long-term trends in India, which Modi has ended up embodying or representing. One, urbanization. We are all more urbanized than we've ever been in our history where 60% of India's GDP uh, comes from urban India. And that has implications for not just people who live and vote in urban India, but also people who live in, who may live or may live part of the year or vote in rural India, but are dependent on the urban economy. Uh, second, demography. Uh, our, our youth dividend or, young, or demographic dividend or youth bulge, call it what you will, which peaks in, I think, the year 2030 in 21st century, uh, begins to kick in from this year in terms of uh, 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 those people start, the people who will be around and young in 2030 will actually begin to vote in this election. And this is the first election where those born after the economic reform of 1991 will begin voting. Uh, Modi has come to represent these two trends or, or pick up, or, or he is at the crossroads of these two trends. There is a, a lot of pent up aspiration and anger in, in, and impatience in this group, especially after the past four or five years uh, of UPA rule, uh, which he's capitalized on. If the UPA had succeeded in keeping the economy in a, on a high growth uh, track for the past four or five years, if, if corruption hadn't been as egregious, if Manmohan Singh had been more in control, then perhaps Mr. Modi would not have been riding as high as he is. One has to accept that. And if he does win, he needs to send a thank you note to Sonia Gandhi and Manmohan Singh. Uh, but uh, it's just this, 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 these two big forces, demography or youth population and uh, uh, urbanization that are really new in India and that's and they make for a very different political landscape from the one Adam may be describing which which is a more traditional Indian landscape and uh, this this could change India and Indian politics in many ways well and we're out of time so I'm going to put you on the spot now and do it sort of gimmicky TV like thing uh, one sentence summary what does Modi for each all each of the three of you what does a Modi government mean for India in one sentence starting with you Adam well, I'm going to be an optimist and say that a Modi government means more decisive leadership and more development for India. Ashok? Uh, a decisive government that uh, uh, is also a smaller government. Swapan? Well, I hope he means it, it means a liberation from dynastic democracy. Well, thank you very much, all three of you. I think this has been a great chat. Look forward to doing this again sometime. Thank you. Thank you.